Well, our number is a uh, few this morning, but I think our spirit is strong based on the enthusiastic singing service that we just enjoyed. We certainly hope that God was praised and glorified and honored by that singing service and by our prayers, our participation in sharing the Lord's Supper together as well, and that our meeting here today will be for the better for all of us. According to the title of the lesson, Christ's Resurrection, the Primary Issue, many people do not focus on the resurrection of Christ when they're trying to make the decision as to whether or not to become a Christian. They focus on many other things instead. For example, many refuse to believe and obey the Word of God due to a variety of doubts and questions that they have concerning the Bible. For example, how could God command the death of innocent children, such as he did in 1 Samuel 15, when he told King Saul to utterly destroy the Amalekites, not just the king, but also all the people, the women, including the children? How could a good God do that, they asked, and for that reason, I don't see how I can follow the word of God. Follow a God who does something like that? Why was slavery condoned in both the Old and the New Testaments? Why did God allow slavery? We consider slavery to be the most grievous sin of our nation in its history. Talked about to a great extent even to this day. How could God allow that to have taken place in the Bible in both the Old and the New Covenants when we ourselves consider it to be such a grievous sin. Why does God allow bad things to happen to good people, generally speaking? Why do innocent people suffer? Who wants to follow a God who allows that? If God was great, he would put a stop to it. If he was good, he would never have allowed them in the first place. So they conclude that God is neither great nor good. Because all the things they observe, they have doubts and questions about God because of those things. How could a good God send people to a place like hell? Millions of people. Maybe even those who have never heard the gospel. What's going to happen to them? And so people look at those observations, they consider those questions and doubts, and it throws them completely off the track of belief and obedience in the Word of God. There are some, no doubt, who use those as excuses because they're looking for excuses. There are others who are seriously troubled by those questions. What about the question of hypocritical Christians? You know, who in the world cannot point to at least one Christian who turned out to be a hypocrite and then said to themselves, why do I want to be like him? He's a hypocrite. He does not practice what he preaches. I don't want to be that type of a person, and if he calls himself a Christian, a Christian is not what I want to be. I think these are serious questions. I think they are important questions. I think if we have a question about why God condones slavery, we ought to investigate it. I think if we have a question about why God allowed innocent children to be killed in wars, we ought to investigate it. Ask those questions. Look into it. Study the Bible. See if we can find out what God's perspective was and what justification he had for doing that. I don't know if we'll ever come to a complete satisfactory answer other than God is mightier and stronger and wiser than I am. So I may not find the answer to all these questions to a satisfactory extent, but I need to investigate them and study, and maybe I'll eventually have to say, uh, God is right, and my faith is in Him regardless. But some of these questions can be answered. We can consider them seriously and come to an understanding of why God allows certain things to happen. So to those people who may be seriously concerned about these questions and doubts, I would say that those are good questions. Those are, if those are honest doubts, then investigate them and look into them. And if we can help you solve those problems, and those que answer those questions, we'd be glad to sit down and study the Bible with you, and maybe 
If we've dealt with those questions and those doubts in the past, we can explain to you how I came to grips with them and how I dealt with them, how I came to understand why these things happen. But when you think about it, actually there are doubts and questions that could prevent almost any endeavor that we take on ourselves. They can interfere or prevent almost anything we decide to do in life. Think about all the possible problems and the negative consequences that can result from almost any decision that we make, such as buying a house. How do we know we can take on two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars worth of debt? We don't know what's going to happen. That's going to be the debt. And it certainly should be seriously considered. We should count the cost before we go to war and before we buy a house or a new car. Think about things that can happen that will prevent us being able to fulfill that. There's doubts and questions we might have that could bring up. Legitimate questions about the wisdom of going on a vacation, of moving to a new city, of taking a new job, of getting married, of having children. Virtually every question that we deal with, every challenge in life, every opportunity to accomplish something, there are questions and doubts associated with that, but more than likely, and more often than not, those questions and doubts, those uncertainties do not keep us from making the decision to go ahead and live in our life in a responsible, reasonable fashion, in a sensible fashion. So making life decisions upon what is not known or on what could happen would really be unreasonable. And it would result in a person never doing anything, never going anywhere, and never really accomplishing anything. We'd be too scared, we'd just hide in our mother's basement, never get out to go to college, never get a job, never try to support ourselves, never to accept any challenge, never try to improve our lot in life because of all questions and fears and doubts about what might could happen. No doubt there are those who think that way, but they would be considered irrational and unreasonable to think that way. God would totally make them unable to accomplish or do anything in life. That's not the way that we are intended to live life. So the fact that people generally make decisions based on what they know Rather than what is not known is rational and reasonable. And this practice is universally recognized in every area of life except when it comes to the Bible. All those questions and doubts we talked about in the first paragraph here cause people to reject the Bible, but it doesn't cause them to give up on life. It doesn't cause them not to go to college or not to incur certain types of debt or not to buy a house or buy a car or take a new job or take a vacation, get married or have children. But it does keep them from following the Word of God. Because in many cases, people are looking for an excuse not to follow God. So as we acknowledged a moment ago, people do have certain questions about the Bible, questions that should be considered seriously, and we should try to answer those questions. But we should not allow those questions, those doubts, and things we do not know about the Bible keep us from acknowledging what we do know about the Bible. Which brings us to the focus of our lesson this morning. What do we know about the Bible? Why do we know it? And is it important? Turn to 1 John chapter 5 and verse 20. It's written right there for you in the, in the outline. 1 John 5 and verse 20. The Apostle John writes... With confidence. He says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> this phrase, we know, is used about 15 times in this one small book of 1 John. And throughout this book, John writes, as do all the New Testament writers, of the deity of Jesus Christ in bold confidence. They write these things knowing 
a feeling and understanding for a fact that the deity of Jesus is true. And that's what gives them the confidence. And where did they get this confidence? They got this confidence from the fact that they were eyewitnesses of the life of Jesus. They were eyewitnesses of the miracles of Jesus. They were eyewitnesses of the death of Jesus on the cross. And they were eyewitnesses of the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. Who spent 40 days in association with the saints. Up to 500 on one occasion after he was resurrected from the dead. Showing, as Acts chapter 1 and verse 3 points out. Many infallible or convincing proofs of his deity. Look at Acts chapter 1 and verse 3. Where this book of Acts by Luke is being introduced. He writes beginning in verse 1. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Until the day in which he was taken up. After he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. Of course, all those things were part of the gospel records. What Jesus did uh, up to the point he was taken up. To whom also he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Seeing Jesus in the flesh was the most important thing that pertained to the kingdom of God. During this 40 day period, they saw Jesus, his resurrected body. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, again we have the same type of testimony given by the Apostle Paul at this time as he writes this book to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians 15 beginning in verse 1, Paul says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you were saved. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he arose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve, and that he was seen by over five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me also, as one born out of due season. The apostle Paul testifies that Jesus appeared to him in his resurrected body. Jesus saw, Paul saw Jesus on that road to Damascus, when he was still Saul of Tarsus. He saw Jesus appear to him as he testifies here. So these apostles proclaim boldly, confidently, that they saw Jesus. They are witnesses of the fact that Jesus, who died on the cross, was resurrected. And that's where they put their faith. They were eyewitnesses. And there are no testimony in any law of court, court of law given that's any stronger than eyewitness testimony. When someone goes to trial and is convicted or vindicated from a crime because of eyewitness testimony, that's solid. That's fact. That's true. That's been declared in a court of law, maybe before a judge or maybe before a jury. And if eyewitness testimony can be given and that eyewitness testimony confirmed or nobody at least can unconfirm it, that's the strongest evidence can be offered. And people were either convicted to death, sentenced to life in prison, or set free based upon eyewitness testimony. There's nothing stronger than that. And it was true back at that time. But consider the idea that it's been 2,000 years since these eyewitnesses of Jesus lived and died and gave their testimony. And I answer to that, so what? Eyewitness testimony is eyewitness testimony today, tomorrow, and 2,000 years down the road. Think about all the trials. I don't have any particular ones in mind necessarily. But the trial of uh, uh, Leopold and Loeb who kidnapped uh, uh, 
the, the baby of a fellow that flew across the Atlantic for the first time, Charles Lindbergh. Are we retrying that? I don't think there are any eyewitnesses to the kidnapping, but there were eyewitnesses to the, what these men said after that, and how they acted, and what they talked about, proclaiming that they had kidnapped that baby. Do we have to go back now since it's been a hundred years, maybe, since that happened? And say, well, we can't accept that testimony because uh, it's been such a long time. That testimony is long, no longer credible or valid. What about the murder of Abraham Lincoln? Does anybody, nobody ever doubted it? There were witnesses there that saw John Wilkes Booth shoot Abraham Lincoln. Do we have to go back now and retry that because it's been... 160 years since that happened? <clears throat> no, that test, of course, that never actually came to trial. It didn't have to. The evidence was so obvious. But you don't have to go back and reconsider the guilt of John Wilkes Booth or others who were involved in that uh, conspiracy. And there were trials after which several were hung because of their, the part they took in that conspiracy. Are we going to go back and retry them and reject the testimony given in those trials? Because it's been 160 years? No. Testimony given in the court of law, eyewitness testimony is good today, tomorrow, and forever. Once the fact has been established, once the evidence has been given to prove something, you don't have to go back and reprove it every generation. And why can't that apply to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? He was resurrected from the dead. Eyewitnesses testified to that. And we've read Acts chapter 1 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and many other passages as well that pointed out that these apostles and others who saw him testified and witnessed the resurrected body of Jesus. Not only that, they not only testified, they gave their lives based upon that testimony. They gave their lives in support of the gospel of Jesus and for the proof that he was the resurrected Son of God who lived and died came forth from that grave, then ascended into heaven, and is now there on the right hand of God, at God's throne, reigning over us. One other point about the eyewitness testimony of John, in the article there it says, how did John know that Jesus was truly God's son? John knew because he was an eyewitness of the resurrected of Christ. And interestingly, the Greek word that's translated we know there, in uh, 1 John chapter 5, and verse 20, where it's first mentioned, and we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. That word know there is translated from the Greek word ido, the Greek verb ido, which the com most common Greek word for to know is gnosko in the Greek. It's used most of the time. But a few times where I do is used, and interestingly, this word I do is connected and sometimes translated by words such as saw, see, look, and see. Turn over to John chapter 20, the Gospel of John chapter 20, and look at verse 8. John 20 verse 8, the same word is used in these three passages, the Greek word translated. John 20 and verse 8, this of course is when Peter and John ran to the tomb of Jesus. Then the other disciples who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. The word saw there is translated from Ido. The same word is translated know in 1 John 5 and verse 20. So this word know that John used in 1 John 5 20 is sometimes translated see. It emphasizes the eyewitness aspect of to know. To know is based on seeing. He knew because he saw. He knew because he was an eyewitness. And then also in John chapter 20, then look at verse 25 and then verse 27. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. That was the words, of course, of doubting Thomas. And the word here, where it says, uh, unless I see, that's the word I do. 
unless he sees that if he testifies, seeing is believing, seeing is knowing. The evidence is what causes us and enables us to know something. If somebody tells me that uh, a car wreck took place up there on I-95 somewhere, I might accept their word for it, but if I go up there and see it, I will know for sure by my own eyewitness testimony that, I, that it actually occurred. I can take somebody else's word for it, but knowing and seeing myself is more is stronger than that, is it not? Then verse 27 of John chapter 20. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here and look at my wound or my hands and reach your hand here and put it to my side. Do you do not be do not be unbelieving but believing? And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. So seeing caused him to declare what? Something he knew. Jesus proved that he was Lord and God because those scars, those nail prints in Jesus' hands convinced Thomas that this truly is the Christ that died on the cross. Then he knew. He saw the evidence. So that's the strength of this word know. In 1 John 5 and verse 20, it uh, points out the evidence is there for seeing and then believing knowing, and then basing your life upon the, that truth. So the point being that what John and the others knew about the resurrected Christ was based on what they had personally witnessed, what they knew was based on what they saw, and what they saw gave them the direction for how they were going to live from that point on. In John chapter 20 and verse 30, the last two verses of this chapter. This point is emphasized again in reference to how Jesus lived and the proof that he offered for who he was. This is a conclusion of the book. John says it all boy, comes down to this. This is what it comes down to, as Robert likes to say. It comes down to verse 30 and 31. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That testimony, that conviction that Jesus was a Christ was not only for the eyewitnesses that saw Jesus, who are now all dead and gone, physically speaking, but their eyewitness testimony of who and what Jesus was would hold up in any court of law in any land where they had honest courts. And there's no reason to detract from it today. Their eyewitness, evidence, testimony is still valid, it's still credible, it's still good today. Jesus Christ as deity, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 7, Jesus Christ is a cornerstone for our faith. But what is a cornerstone? for the deity of Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1 verse 4 points out that Jesus was declared to be the Son of God by what? By the resurrection of the dead, the power of the resurrection of the dead. I think we can see now why that word power, the resurrection of Jesus is powerful. It's powerful enough to overcome doubts and questions as to what anybody would come up with any excuse for not obeying Jesus. So Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone of our faith and the resurrection is the chief cornerstone of the deity of Jesus. That's how important and powerful the resurrection is. Simply put, Christianity is based on the resurrection. Christianity is either true or false based upon the historical event of Christ's resurrection. If the resurrection of Christ is not true, then Christianity is not true. And the Bible needs to be thrown out and discarded as a book of lies, a book that is in religion is based upon a false foundation. Everything rests upon the credibility of this one event, the resurrection of Jesus. That's why it's so important. That's why it's so powerful, because everything is based on it. People say, well, there's a lot of good things in the book. You don't have to accept the resurrection, folks. 
If you don't accept the resurrection, throw the Bible away because it's a book of lies and there's no reason why you should read it or study it and definitely not base your life upon it. Throw the Bible away, it's worthless without the resurrection of Jesus. Because otherwise, as I mentioned, it's a book built upon lies. Because from the very beginning to the very end of the Bible, the truth is based upon this one event. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That's what binds it all together. And if we don't believe that, then the Bible is worthless. Skeptics have tried for centuries to throw doubt on the resurrection. But the eyewitness testimony of the apostles remains credible. The resurrection has not been canceled out and our faith can confidently be placed upon the solid rock foundation of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This we must know and can know to be true. Now go back to the beginning of my lesson. We talked about those doubts and questions that people come up with with regard to why they refuse to obey and believe the Word of God. They say, well, God's command required that innocent children be killed. God condones slavery, apparently, in the Bible. God allows evil to exist in the world. He's designed hell as a place where millions of people will be cast when his life is over to spend eternity in that place that's described as being so evil. But you know, those questions must not be allowed to annul or discredit the reality of the resurrection. The, react, the resurrection is where the battle needs to be fought. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 again. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12. This, of course, we know is a major chapter in the Bible on the power and the importance of the resurrection of Jesus in terms of our Christian faith. Because there are people there, apparently, who do not believe in the resurrection. And Paul begins in verse 12 and says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? So he's establishing the very foundation for his argument that Christ has been resurrected from the dead, therefore we can have faith that we're going to be resurrected from the dead because that's the promise of Christ who was resurrected from the dead. But verse 13 says, If there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, and Christ is not risen, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. This context points out that all those doubts and questions that people often raise as to why they don't believe and obey the Bible are irrelevant. Because if Jesus had not been why bother? The resurrection of Jesus from the dead actually gives credibility to those questions. Those become good questions. Because of some people, they, they pose a contradiction between Jesus, the resurrected Son of God, and these things that I see in the world that don't seem to match. The death of innocent children, the evil in the world, the, and all those things. And how do you put those together? And that's just a, a legitimate concern and a legitimate question to have. And as I said twice already, it needs to be looked at and investigated. And we need to try to answer those questions. But this verse points out that the resurrection of Christ is what gives credibility to those questions and doubts because it appeals to the power and the truthfulness of the resurrection. If the resurrection didn't, play, didn't take place, those questions wouldn't matter. Who cares if innocent people die? Who cares if good people are injured and suffer pain and persecution? Uh, life is here, that's all there is, so why even bother about those questions? But the resurrection of Christ gives legitimacy and in substance to those questions. The fact that there is a resurrection is powerful and important. And he goes on to point out that we've read that if Christ was not resurrected from the dead, 
Paul was preaching lies. Christians, of all people in the world, would be the most miserable because we would only have hope in this life in Christ. But since he did die and was resurrected, we have hope that is eternal in Jesus Christ. So the battle for one's faith, therefore, must be fought on the field of that which we know. Which the apostles said they knew based on their eyewitness evidence, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we know. That's what they know. That's what they proved. That's what was proven. And they were eyewitnesses of the proof. One must not be sidetracked by what is not known, by what is feared, by what is doubted, or by what is questioned. A person may have serious questions about things like children being killed in wars commanded by God, by slavery in the Bible, by evil in the world, by eternal hell as a destination of millions, etc. But those questions will not be allowed to annul or discredit the reality of the resurrection. That's why if you're doubtful about whether you're going to believe and obey the Bible, go to the heart of the issue. Examine the resurrection. Is there evidence for the resurrection? Think about that. Consider that. That's where the battle for your faith has to be fought. That's the battleground. That's the field by which we have to wage this war for our faith. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what it all depends upon. That's what it all hinges on. That's where the power is. And that's where we have to make our arguments and make our stand. So examine the evidence offered by the, for the resurrection by those who are eyewitnesses. Do not flippantly discount their testimony. If you believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then on that basis, and on that basis only, become a Christian. If you then have serious questions about these other issues, then by all means study them and seek out an answer, but don't throw away what is known about the resurrection on the basis of other issues that include things that are not known. Pick up your hymn book at this time and turn to the number that you selected. As a song of encouragement, I know we don't have any doubters of the resurrection of Jesus in our assembly this morning, but maybe these thoughts can help you deal with somebody that you know who has doubts, who has questions, who brings up these very issues as reasons why they're not obeying the Bible, and try to get them down to the nub of the issue, the resurrection of Jesus. That's where it all comes down to. Think about these things, if you will. And together we'll pick up our hymn books and stand to sing the song of invitation at this time.